the last several Sundays. A number of us have been not here because of a cold. This morning, a number of us are not here because of the cold. <laughs> so, welcome, true Minnesotans. We will um, continue and, and, and this morning uh, conclude our little synopsis with Constantine Cavarnos. Synopsis means a gathering around, and uh, we, you know, it can be a gathering around a teaching or a preaching. So this morning, our guest lecturer is Constantine Cavarnos, and he's going to be teaching us uh, the basics of um, the Christian life uh, from this book, Man's Spiritual Evolution. So I'm going to bring Dr. Cavarnos up now, and uh, we will turn it. Well, before I turn it over to him, just a reminder that uh, starting next Sunday, uh, our intention, our plan is to, uh, uh, Cindy will be our guest lecturer. She's going to be sharing with us the uh, angelology or the doctrine of angels of the early Christian church uh, to get us ready for looking at the epistle to the Hebrews and the doctrine of Christ that we find and of salvation that we find in the Epistle to the Hebrews, and that should be taking us over to the last, over for the next several Sundays. So, uh, let's uh, bring Dr. Cavarnos up, and uh, just turn it over to him, so Dr. Cavarnos. <laughs> yes, uh, well, good morning, it's so good to be with you. Yes, I died in 2011, but I am still alive in Christ, and so I can still talk to you about the mysteries of Christ. So this morning I want to talk to you from this book that I wrote. It's actually a, a, a lecture that I gave to a Holy Virgin uh, Protection Cathedral in, uh, North, in New York City uh, back in uh, 1992. December 12, 1992 is when I gave this lecture. So I was at the, close to the end, I wasn't at the end of my life when I delivered this lecture. I was only, what, 74 years old? Uh, but uh, this book, this lecture was not published in book form until 2006. So when I wrote the preface for this book in 2006, I was already 88 years old. I didn't know it at the time, but of course I know it now, that I was about five years away from my passing from this life to the next life. But because, you know, we live in the resurrection of Christ, it is possible for me to visit you this morning. Uh, from the other side, even though you're still on this side, I can still visit you from the other side in the resurrection of Christ because whenever we do the divine liturgy, we are coming into the presence of the resurrection of Christ, uh, coming into the presence of the risen Christ. And uh, even though we're on this side, nonetheless, we are on the other side in the presence of Christ. And this is one of the great blessings of being an Orthodox Christian. Um, so uh, let me... Um, let me begin post haste here now um, to uh, share with you um, the subject, um, kind of giving you uh, an abbreviated form of the lecture that I gave in 1992 at the Orthodox Cathedral in New York City. Um, the, uh, I titled this, The Man's Spiritual Evolution. And uh, it may well be that the word evolution catches the eye, catches your mind because it's not a church word. It's a word from science. Um, it's not even a biblical word. I didn't bother, well, maybe Constantine didn't. I'm going to step out of cover. I myself did not bother to look. I don't remember seeing this word in the Bible. So I don't know that it's even a biblical word. Um, so why did, you know, why did Constantine choose to use this term for his book, Man's Spiritual Evolution. Well, okay, now I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I guess I'm going to revert back to myself. Um, as I said, the term is from science, it's not from the church. But I suspect that Father Cavarnus intends by his use of this term to put the theory of evolution in its proper place in the mind of the Orthodox Christian seeking salvation which is union with God, or theosis. That is what salvation is in the Orthodox Church. It's not just being forgiven of one's sins. 
The Old Testament had that, had that in spades. It's about union with God. Theosis, that's what salvation is. So um, I suspect that Dr. Kavarnas is using this term evolution to highlight the, uh, how different theosis or salvation in the church is from the scientific doctrine of evolution. Uh, biblical, bibl biological evolution and, uh, evolutionism, he says, on page 20. He never really, he never explains why he uses the term evolution. Um, but I think that he does give the reason and what I'm about to quote from you, from, from this, for, to you. Um, he says, biological evolutionism holds that there is an emergence of higher organisms out of lower ones through the interplay of various external forces. Darwin stressed the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest. I'm going to highlight that word here, external forces. The survival of the fittest, the struggle for existence. Orthodox Christian spiritual evolutionism teaches that spiritual ascent is not at all something automatic, not at all a matter of chance or external circumstances. Rather, it is a result of deliberate personal choice. Personal means free. A deliberate free choice and a conscious spiritual striving. Something unspoken, this is me talking, something unspoken is being said here loudly, I think. Biological evolutionism is a scientific theory, underline, theory. But the spiritual evolutionism of theosis is not a theory at all. It is a concrete fact experienced by countless men and women over the centuries. The status of the theory of, the, of biological evolutionism has no bearing on the fact of theosis and should not be allowed to distract the Orthodox Christian away from what he needs to do in order to be saved, which is to be deified. We should be living for theosis, for salvation. This is the true purpose of human life, drawing now from uh, Archimandrite Gregory, uh, also of the Holy Mountain, so one suspects that Dr. Kavranos, if he made multiple trips to the Holy Mountain, he may well have known very well um, Archimedes Gregory. Any who want, anyone who wants to, anyone who wants to, can discover that the spiritual evolution of the Church is true and absolutely real. We can discover, we can discover that for ourselves, each one of us. One can never get beyond the hypothetical nature of biological evolutionism, however much you study. But the question of, of evolution has absolutely no bearing on the possibility for us to evolve, to change, into a higher DFI state or form if we simply do what the Church tells us to do. So that's what I think is going on behind Dr. Kavarno's choice of the term evolution. Remember, Sebastian remember, Tom Holder, you, you might, David will remember, Tom will remember. Back in the early 90s, in the 80s, 90s, evolution was kind of a hot topic. And Barb will remember. I don't know if it's so hot anymore. It's kind of um, cooled off for whatever reason. Um, for the burden of this particular lecture that was given by Dr. Kavarnas in 1992 is to establish the fact that biblical salvation is about a real change. It's about a change. Just, well, just like evolution is about change, so also the biblical doctrine of salvation is about a real change. But the biblical terms would be transformation, transfiguration, um, and then there are other terms, you know, the renewal, 
of the, uh, the, re our, the our renewal, um, the, uh, the uh, becoming a new creation. Um, the teaching that one can change inwardly, I'm now quoting from Dr. Cavernos, the teaching that one can change, that one can change inwardly, spiritually, from the old man into the new man, presupposes that human nature, in the sense of our character, that is, in the sense of our habits, dispositions, thoughts, emotions, desires, aspirations, so forth and so on, these can be changed from a lower to a higher state or form. This possibility is clearly and emphatically asserted by the Orthodox Church Fathers. Now, as I continue, I'm basically just going to be quoting from Dr. Kavarnos, so you can pretend again that I'm actually Dr. Kavarnos uh, talking. Uh, here we go from page 8. Man's spiritual evolution <clears throat> is viewed as progressing, progressing upward in a step-by-step -step manner. It begins with a decisive act. So as we go here, we might be contemplating how different, you know, how we might be contemplating how Dr. Gavarnos is describing how different, um, using his terms, um, orthodox evolutionism is from biological evolutionism. And here's one, here again is another um, key difference. Um, man's spiritual evolution begins with a decisive act of free choice. And a firm resolve. It must be accompanied by a firm resolve. How many of us, how many people make the choice, but they don't follow through? Um, salva um, a firm resolve to strive wholeheartedly for salvation. And again, salvation is union with God. Salvation is called theosis or deification. It, it proceeds with zealous eschesis, or discipline, you know, spiritual discipline. A zealous eschesis, unrelenting work upon oneself, aspiring to rise more and more towards spiritual perfection. Um, honestly, I, I, mean, I grew up outside the Orthodox Church. I don't remember hearing this outside the Orthodox Church. Nothing about zealous eschesis, nothing about unrelenting, underlined, unrelenting work on oneself, um, aspiring to rise more and more towards spiritual perfection. I don't remember ever hearing anything like that. The Eastern Church Fathers speak of this change of the old man into the new man. They speak of it as the beautiful change. They speak of it as the good change. They speak of it as the blessed change. The word used for this change, it means a change of form. A change of form, in other words, a qualitative change. We get a sense of this from St. Paul. Be not conformed, right? Be not formed with the world, or as in, with the world, but be ye transformed. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where it starts, is in the mind, the thoughts, the intellect. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Dr. Carvarnos quotes at this point from St. Macarius the Egyptian in the 4th century. Human nature is capable of change. It can incline to evil or to the good. I mean, look at us. <laughs> believe, me or, believe it or not, I have changed since I was 5 years old. <laughs> this is not what I looked like when I was 5 years old. So there you have it. We have in front of right in front of us. We all change is 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 a uh, human nature is capable of change. You might even say that human nature is to change. It can, but the change can go in many different directions. Um, it can incline to evil, 
or to the good. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. This is why our Lord Jesus Christ came, to change and to renew and remake the soul, through trans which, which through transgression has been ruined by the passions. It's, beautiful, it's a beautiful proclamation, is it not? How, how, many of us have not, how many of us have not changed for the worst, you know, in our thoughts, our aspirations, I mean, the, the things that we've given our desires to, and it's had an effect on us mentally, psychologically, emotionally, maybe even physically. But our nature's capacity to change has not been removed from by, by that. We still have the capacity to change so that if we want to and make a deci decisive act of free choice, we can still change from wherever we are, we can still change toward and, and, and pursue the blessed change, the beautiful change, and, uh, and aspire to union with God. St. Macarius, Dr. Kavarnos is still quoting from uh, St. Macarius in the 4th century, goes on to explain what the good, beautiful, and blessed change consists in. It consists of a new mind and a new soul, new eyes and new ears, a new spiritual tongue, not to mention a new heart. So deliberate choice is key for this change to take place, says Dr. Kavarnos. St. Simeon, the new theologian, says that this blessed change comes about as a free gift it comes about as a free gift to the person who freely and wholeheartedly surrenders himself to Christ. Any Christian, says St. Simeon, who has not undergone this change should not blame his nature, but he should blame his choice not to surrender himself to Christ wholeheartedly. This means keeping Christ's commandments faithfully at all times. And then again, Dr. Kavranos brings in this note of working on oneself unrelentingly. He says, he says he, this means keeping Christ's commandments faithfully at all times and subjecting oneself to relentless self-discipline of soul and body. Soul and body. So, you know, that means disciplining one's mind, disciplining one's thoughts, disciplining one's desires, even one's feelings, not letting oneself get caught up in one's feelings, but becoming. I was reading yesterday from St. Diodokos of Fotiki, another key word would be self-control. To control oneself even in the midst of, of, of uh, when, when we are uh, attacked by passions, or the desire for passions. The process of being deified, <clears throat> or of being saved, of uniting oneself to Christ, begins with, a, with an act of free choice, he's repeating himself, um, of the higher good and state of being. Each man has a soul endowed with reason, free choice, and self-control, says Dr. Kavarno. So yeah, in our soul are these, are these powers. Um, what did we have? We had a reason. <coughs> yeah, reason. Let's do reason. Free choice. And which implies self-control. We have these powers. These are, these are essential properties to our nature. By use of these powers, and illumined by the Orthodox faith, one makes the choice to follow the upward path of spiritual development. One makes the choice without being compelled by anything or by anyone, not even by God. For some, that might be not such good news. It'd be nice if we could be robots, wouldn't it? And God would just zap us and bang, we do it. But no, we've been created in His image and in His likeness. And so we are fundamentally free creatures created to love God. And you can't love God if we're being forced to love Him. It must be a free choice. And so this, this, this capacity, this possibility of being changed from wherever we are now to the better, and, be, and, and to get taken up in this beautiful change, it begins with our own decisive act of free choice. Like I've said to many of you, I'm sorry, but there's no pill that you can take. <laughs> there's no magic pill. It's up to you and to me. We must make that choice. 
Uh, continuing with Dr. Kavarnas, <clears throat> Jesus speaks of this free choice as the narrow gate. Why will many seek to enter it, into it but not be able to? Because they will be kept in bondage by their own attachments to non-spiritual values, wealth, worldly honors, and pleasures. The gate that leads to the path of spiritual development is called narrow, because it represents a choice that excludes all those whose great cares and aspirations are directed to non-spiritual things. For such individuals, there is the broad path and the wide gate that leads to spiritual destruction. Once the choice for spiritual ascent has been made with firm resolve, there opens up before the chooser a spiritual path that calls for unceasing struggle. I didn't hear this either before I became Orthodox. In fact, even in the Orthodox Church, well, I, I heard it, but you know, you come into the church from outside, you have all these filters, right? So you're filtering everything you're hearing, and whatever does not uh, conform to what you're used to, you either ignore it or you just it just it doesn't get through. So it took a few years even of coming into the Orthodox Church before I began to understand that um, that to uh, choose that that when I chose when my family and I chose to become Orthodox, we were not we were entering into the Garden of Eden. Yes, we were entering into a garden, but you know we're making our way um, to the summit of the garden, and it's a steep climb. <laughs> You know, the tree of life is at the summit of the, of the Edenic mountain. Um, so, um, to make this choice to follow Christ, to pursue Christ, to find Christ, to become one with Christ, requires unceasing struggle. This struggle is an inner struggle. Um, quite different from the outer struggle for existence spoken of by Darwin. So here's another reference to evolution explaining why he may have chosen this term evolution in his title. It's a, it's a quite a different struggle from the struggle for existence spoken of by Darwin. The inner struggle has to do with cleansing the chooser of all vices, all negative thoughts, all negative emotions and desires, and the struggle to acquire all the spiritual excellencies, excellences or virtues thereby attaining likeness to God, union with God, theosis, divinization, deification, sanctification, salvation. These are all the terms that we use to describe and refer to union with God. But in fruitful spiritual struggle, one does not fight without help. We have the help of Almighty God, as well as of holy angels and the saints, as St. John Climacus to help us toward the acquisition of the virtues. Nevertheless, the path of spiritual ascent is a difficult one, calling for continuous effort. Again, that note, continuous effort. This is why, call, cry, why Christ calls the way leading to salvation or to life narrow. Striving on the path of spiritual development consists in, the, in opposing one's own faults, not the other person's, but one's own faults, one's own base desires, one's own negative thoughts, fantasies, and emotions, and endeavoring to uproot them. Get rid of them. Or as St. Paul would say, put them to death, crucify them. It also consists, however, in endeavoring to acquire the virtues, higher thoughts, and feelings. St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, says that in order to traverse successfully the path of spiritual development, one needs an authoritative and exemplary teacher. And he presents Jesus as the perfect teacher. And in the next place, St. Paul. To make the initial choice to pursue the path of salvation and to sustain it requires faith. Remember in the catechism class we've been talking about faith. That faith 
we can say, I mean, there's so many different definitions of faith that you run into in the Holy Fathers. Um, and so I've made the effort of trying to distill all of it into you know, kind of its, in, in its irreducible essence. Um, and I'm quite, I'm quite confident that we can say that faith in its irreducible essence is our desire and our love and our longing oriented toward God. So if our, if our desire, love, and longing is oriented not towards God, well, it can't be oriented anywhere, because oriented means facing the east. So if it's inclined away from the east, away from the resurrection of Christ, then we, can, we call that unbelief or faithlessness. But when our, our desire, our love, and our longing are oriented toward God, toward the beauty and the truth of the eternal, and away from the deceitfulness of the world's beauty and enticements, we call that faith. Living faith is susceptible of growth and of being perfected. I mean, you can just see that in the uh, imagery of the baptism. When you turn the west, renounce Satan, you spit upon him, turn around, face east, and then slowly you start making your way up until by the end of the service, you're at the Amvon receiving from the Holy Chalice. That movement from the narthex in the west all the way to the Amvon in the east when you are receiving Christ's body and blood, you can say that is a, a visible image of faith, this movement of faith. And of course, the way you got from there to there was through the font, through the tomb of Christ. Yes, Matthew? Well, calling to mind the I mean, there's, there's something of a paradox in this as well. Because if we recall that the, uh, the man whose daughter had died and brought her to Jesus, and what did, what, and what did he say to And Jesus said to him, you need to believe. In oh, yes, yes. He said, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Yeah. That is to say, I'm not oriented toward you. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you need to help me with this. Yeah. But, but obviously he wanted to be. Yes. So, you know, there you are. And we just need we just need to want to be, um, and and the beauty I would say of the of the of the, um, of the concrete imagery of the baptism, is that you know it, it it puts physical shape to what I want to happen inside of me. So I come to the font, I come to the baptism. You know, I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't believe. I don't believe. Help me to. I want to believe. Help me to. Help me to believe. And so the church grabs you, and she helps you. And she walks you through, you know, the turning of the soul. Um, but again, remember, it says, uh, if you have faith as a mustard seed, a little tiny mustard seed, um, and, and God can work on that. So how, you know, faith is like a seed. It, remember, okay, from the genealogy, that the uh, faith of Abraham was the seed of Abraham, and it blossomed into the virgin Theotokos, and then it received Christ. So our faith is a seed, and so if, however we're working that, um, it, it, is, it is susceptible of growth and perfection, wherever it starts. Um, faith brings knowledge of God, and so faith is not blind. I remember going to church camp before I was Orthodox, and I was, you know, we were being exhorted to believe, and well, of course, nobody believes, because how can you believe what you don't see? Oh, well, take a leap of faith, uh, just, just a blind leap of faith. Uh, you know, blindly leap out there. <laughs> just made me so irritated. Um, so I was delighted. I was so, I almost did a somersault when I came across this in St. Maximus when he says explicitly, faith is not blind. Faith, in fact, is knowledge of God. Um, so, and, and, and uh, faith satiates the soul uh, because it is love for God. So again, you know, take the small seed. And however much you can, I mean, this man, okay, this man, help my unbelief. But where's he going? Is he saying that? <laughs> He's moving to Christ. And what does Christ do? He takes a little bit of faith and he heals his daughter. You know, so he takes the soul, he takes the faith and he works with it. Faith, and now Dr. Kavarnas says this, faith grows especially through association with holy men and under the particular guidance of a wise and experienced spiritual father or guide who is usually a monk, and often not in priestly orders. But then he goes on to say, um, Such persons have always been few. 
I think we need to hear this in the United States because there's this, there's this epidemic going on among new Orthodox Christians who in their zeal are seeking a spiritual father and we have all of these monks who are more than happy to claim themselves as spiritual fathers. Um, be careful. And let's take Dr. Kavarna's word to heart here. Such persons have always been few. In our spiritually barren age, they are extremely rare and chiefly to be found on the holy mountain. And even on the holy mountain, they're hard to find. So anybody claiming to be a spiritual father, I run away from them as fast as I can. Now I'm going to do a breakaway. I'm going to take you to the introduction to the Philokalia, which speaks to this point. This, there's, there's five volumes of this particular edition of the Philokalia. This is volume one. I'm going to read from the introduction. It must be stressed that this spiritual path that Dr. Kavarnos is talking about, obviously it doesn't say that, that Dr. Kavarnos is talking about, it doesn't say that. I'm telling you that that's what the, that it must be, to put it into context. It must be stressed that this spiritual path presupposes a particular understanding of the church and a particular view of salvation inextricably bound up with its sacramental and liturgical life. This spiritual path has not developed independently of or alongside the sacramental and liturgical life of the church. It is part and parcel of it. To attempt to practice the spiritual path that Dr. Kovarnas is talking about apart from active participation in this sacramental and liturgical life is to cut it off from its living roots and to act with a presumption that may well have consequences of a disastrous kind, both mental and physical. <clears throat> if the basic condition of participation in the sacramental and liturgical life of the church is fulfilled, then this path is open to all to follow, each to the best of his ability and whatever the circumstances under which he lives. The path with its goal is one and the same, whether followed within or outside a monastic environment. What is, this, what is essential is that one does not follow it in an arbitrary and ignorant manner. Personal guidance from a qualified teacher should always be sought for. If such guidance is not to be found, that active participation in the sacramental and liturgical life of the church, always necessary, will have an added importance in overcoming the obstacles and dangers inherent in any quest of a spiritual nature. Back to Dr. Kavarnos. Besides a spiritual guide, <clears throat> the reading of edifying orthodox works or listening to others read such works is of great value throughout one's journey on the spiritual path. The holy men of Mount Athos ascribe great value to reading three groups of readings. One is the uh, Light of the Saints. The second group of readings, a set of readings, um, is the called the Evercatinos. Has anyone heard of that? I should ask. Yeah, who has heard of that? The Evercatinos. And then the third group of, of group of readings would be from the Philokalia, which means love of beauty. Yes. Matthew. So, uh, bringing us back to that beautiful, good, blessed change. Mm -hmm. Is that the same Greek word kalos? Yes. That is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Kalia. Philo kalia. A kalos uh, metamorphosis or whatever. Morphe. Um, um, on one of his visits to Mount Athos, Dr. Kavarnos at once asked a saintly monk, the name was Hermit Gabriel, um, if he recommended reading the Philo kalia to persons like him, well, to be honest, like me, who live in the world, because I started reading the Philokalia, the, <laughs> I think the first day I became Orthodox, I started reading from this, and I've been reading from it ever since. 
Um, and uh, this was Gabriel's, the monk Gabriel's reply. He said, the Philokalia is an excellent work, but it is for those advanced in the spiritual life. It is university education. One first must go to grammar school, next to high school, and only then is he ready to go to a university. Um, so at one start with the Evergatinos, I asked. And here's what the Evergatinos looks like. Um, it's a beautiful book, actually. It's, it's actually come, the full, the complete text comes in four volumes. This is volume one. Uh, it's the, it, it's just, it's, it's like, uh, it, it's stories. It's stories um, that are easy to read, fun to read. Um, I, generally, the stories may be a page long. And it looks like they have all kinds of moral lessons in it. Uh, this first part of the first volume of the, of the Evergutinos are different stories that are intended to show um, that repentance is always possible. No matter how many times one falls, repentance is always possible. And just give stories to, to uh, stress, to, to, uh, to, um, to em emphasize that fact. Um, if we had time, I, I, I would read a story, but I don't know that I have time. But anyway, th so this would be high school, says, says the, um, no, so the Gabriel, so Dr. Gavrano says, should I start with the wind, then with the Evergatinos? And he says, no, this too is advanced, it is high school. One must start with something more elementary. One should read simple lives of saints in order to learn what kind of persons they were, how they lived, and what they did. Then one can proceed to the higher steps. For there are stages in the path of one's beautiful change. These are the stages of the beginner, the intermediate, and the perfect, the freshman, the middler, the senior. For each of these levels of spiritual development, a different kind of mental food is particularly suitable. Food that is digestible and assimilable by a person at each level. Because of the scarcity of English language publications presenting Orthodox saints, I don't know if that's so much true now, but it obviously was true when uh, Dr. Gavarnas was writing this, and realizing the great value such works have for awakening us spiritually and guiding us on the path of inner development, I inaugurated in 1971 a series of volumes under the title Modern Orthodox Saints. I chose modern modern. Orthodox saints, because I feel that for the Christian there is no teaching that is more efficacious than reading the life of a saint, especially of a saint who has lived in one's own period. So 15 volumes of this series has appeared in print at the time that Dr. Kavarnas was writing. This is one of those volumes, volume 10, which Emily and I presented to you last spring, uh, the saints Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene of Lesvos. But as I said, I think that, the, that there are many more lives of saints that are now available. You know, there's the life of St. Joseph the Hesychus. There's a life of for St. Porphyrios, uh, wounded by love. Uh, there's, the li there's the biography of St. Paisios, the, the Athenite. Um, can anybody tell, me, tell us of other uh, sources, lives of saints? St. Sophronius. St. who? Sophronius. Sophronius. Oh, Archimandrius Sophronius? Okay. Do you remember the title of that book? St. Nectarius, um, there's the uh, St. Siloan, uh, the monk of Mount Athos. That was actually the first book that my wife and I read. That was the first book my wife read. She read that book and she came away from it saying, I don't know how anybody would, want to be, would not want to be Orthodox and not, and after reading this book. Because it was so, the spirituality was so deep. We had never encountered such spirituality outside the Orthodox Church. And we were hungry for it. Um, but can you also see how... Um, so, um, you remember that Dr. Gavarnas is saying up here that um, of great value, it is um, association with, ex with good men. Um, where did he say that? Um, but you remember he said that, that we, uh, that we need to surround ourselves with good people. Can you imagine, can you imagine um, growing up in a, uh, well, just growing up in a monastic community, let's say, take that as an example. Uh, where all the brothers are gentle and, and, and devout and loving, they love God, um, and uh, you're just, you know, they just, they just exude the, the beauty and the love of God. Can you imagine growing up in that? 
Can you growing, imagine growing up in a house where mom and dad are devout and loving and love God and love the church and where the church is like your life? Can you imagine growing up in such a place? How it's going to shape you? Well, in the absence of that, you know, so many of us are Orthodox by ourselves. We, my, some, many of us still live with families that are not Orthodox. But we have families who are not. And it's like we're, we are our own, our own little ghetto. My house is my own little Orthodox ghetto. And I only come into contact with other Orthodox when I come to church. Um, and St. Hermes, I think, is a beautiful place because we have so many wonderful people here. Um, and I think that, it, you know, I think St. Hermes has, you know, done some good things to a lot of people just because the, just because that's a good place. But can you, but, but absent of that, can you, can you, can you understand it? Can you see how if you're getting to know the saints, now you're bringing the saints into your life. And now you're established, you are establishing around yourself um, your own community of saints. And you um, go back and you read their life as often as you want to, whenever you need to. You have a question, you have a problem, might uh, trigger a memory of what you read about this saint in this particular period. So, so you go back to that passage. And it's like you have the saint now, even though he's, he's passed on um, and is now present to us in the uh, church, nonetheless through the life that was written of him, that saint is, can be present to us. He can be our friend, and we can kind of, you know, start kind of growing up you know, or, or living our, our Orthodox life in the presence of our saints that we are that we are beginning to know by reading their lives. So um, this is something that all of us then can do. Um, I've, I've reached the end of my time, and thankfully, I've reached the end of my pretty much the end of my text. So that's a it's a fortuitous uh, coincidence. Um, I might just uh, say then that the rest of Dr. Cavarno's book, which I have not, is a, it continues his discussion on the process of purifying all the powers of the soul. It gives an overview of basic principles of the interdiscipline of prayer, including our attention inward, watching our thoughts <coughs> from which the passions and vices grow, distinguishing our thoughts, discriminating between our thoughts that are heavenly, natural, good, and pure, and those which are not, that are demonic, unnatural, impure. He gives an overview of the different faculties of the soul and their different functions, specifically the mind, the will, conscience, and imagination. And he does so in a very basic way, um, in a very you know, introductory way. So those of us who are just starting out, uh, even though those of us who are, who are down the road a bit, but may feel that we still need some introductory training um, would be would, would benefit I think from reading this book a man's spiritual evolution so man's spiritual evolution is like a basic primer it's like a it's like a perhaps a, le a grammar school level description of the spiritual path and I do recommend it to everyone but especially of course I recommend it to all of us who feel the need for the most basic instruction on how to begin and how to do the upward ascent of salvation finally I want to say this that uh, um, you know, take the um, cautions about reading the Philokalia, in particular, or maybe the Evergotinas. You know, take them, take them seriously, but don't you don't have to you don't have to abide by them. I mean, honestly, i I'm reading the Phil, I've been reading the Philokalia for years, and um, yes, there's much of it that I did not understand because it was over my head, uh, but I, I I pretty much kind of lived in this um, in the Philokalia, and I don't think that it hurt me. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, it, there's just there's some things that you won't understand, but as you progress, you'll begin to understand them. Um, so don't be don't be scared off from reading the Philokalia or the Evergatinos, but just know that that there is a gradation. Uh, read the lives of kind of ground yourself in the lives of the saints, and then next you can ground yourself in the Evergatinos, um, which is like the lives of the saints also, but it's in story. It's a a more, you know, it's just it's the next level up, and then also the philokalia. I don't think, and, and of course, the, all of this is centered on Holy Scripture. Michael? Yeah, how about the prologue of Or? Thank you, that's another great one. The yeah, prologue of Or, oh, oh, yes. That's a great, that is a great source. Um, so, yeah. With that, um,
let's uh, make our way upstairs and um, let's all participate in this upward path towards salvation. God bless you.